Welcome to the Ides of Macro, where we discuss investing and trading through the lens of global macroeconomics. Welcome everybody to Lycan's The Ides of Macro podcast. And this month, I'm absolutely delighted to have Harris Kupperman of Praetorian Capital Management. And hopefully we're going to talk about pretty much everything. He looks at everything from macro to commodities to event driven. He's also very vocal, which is a great thing to be when you're investing. So a, a very warm welcome, Harris. Hey, thanks for having me on, Roger. So, um, you know, what I'd love to kick off with is we're in this sort of very enigmatic environment at the moment where you've got some people who are super, super bearish, some uber bullish people. You've got positioning all over the place. Are we in a recession? Are we not? What's your take? I mean, what do you think we're currently, you know, the environment? Let's focus really on the U.S. first, because that's still really the linchpin of everything. But where do you think we are in this sort of is it or is it not a recession type scenario? Yeah, sure. I mean, I ask myself that question a lot also. Uh, you know, just, just for disclosure, none of this investment advice. Uh, but, um, you know, I think it's a two-speed economy. I think people, uh, you know, view the world in kind of a binary lens. And why can't we just have a two-speed economy? Why can't you have parts of the economy, anything tied to interest rates, uh, being miserable? You know, commercial real estate, venture capital, private equity. And, you know, the, the, those industries tend to cluster in the coasts and in the big cities. And so, you know, the narrative's written by a bunch of Wall Street strategists that live in Manhattan and all their friends have had a bad run of it because they're all in commercial real estate and private equity. Uh, and then, you know, you have the rest of the country, 200 million people, they haven't had it better ever. I mean, their wages are up for the first time since the 1980s, you know, adjusted for inflation. Uh, you, can't, you can't find workers. I mean, look at the jobs numbers. I mean, uh, the wage numbers are going crazy. It doesn't show up in the official data because, you know, you have some high earners in the cities that are getting fired. But, you know, the average guy in the middle of the country you just got to double on their wages in the last two years. So I think it's a two-speed economy, and I think people miss that. And there's a lot of industries that are really doing amazing. I mean, we, we invest in a lot of industrial companies. I mean, they're just killing it. It's, it's incredible. And everyone says, you know, this is a cyclical industry, and, you know, everything looks best right before the bottom falls out, and maybe that's the case. But as of right now, the bottom hasn't fallen out, and these guys are still ramping up. I mean, so yeah, I think I've heard, I mean, I've heard people say sort of, a similar sort of thing, which is it's, it's kind of been we haven't had a recession because it's been a kind of rolling recession. We saw small businesses and some households really kind of very pessimistic, but the middle early part of last year. But that's kind of moved on now. We've not actually seen it hit across the whole of the economy yet. And as you say, so jobs data, because, you know, we've never had a recession in U.S. history, at least since the war, without unemployment picking up. Do you think there is a chance that firstly, we're still working through some very distorted data post-COVID. And secondly, policy hits with a lag and probably it's still got to hit the true economy, the real economy, maybe not towards, and maybe towards the end of this year. Well, I mean, Jay Powell has told you that he intends to go until something breaks. And I take him at his word. Uh, the Federal Reserve always ends up breaking stuff. Uh, I think he'll succeed beyond his wildest dreams. But it might take some more time. I mean, We've never had uh, the Fed raising rates into an inflationary cycle. And, you know, us on Wall Street, we look at the real economy, but the average guy is thinking in the, the nominal economy. And, you know, nominal GDP is doing something like eight. And that feels really, really good if you're uh, an earner in the nominal economy. I mean, uh, earnings are doing quite well. I think people were surprised at how strong Q1, Q1 earnings were. Well, that's because revenue is a nominal data point. You know, it's, I, I think people miss this fact. You know, we, we previously had official 2% CPI or less. And as a result, you know, the, 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 you know, the nominal doesn't, you know, is basically tied directly to GDP. And that's why earnings fell over in the last couple of recessions. I just think this is going to be a different sort of cycle. It's going to be more like the 70s. And people haven't really studied the 70s. People say they studied the 70s, but then they haven't really studied the 70s. And they don't really conceptually understand what it's going to be like in the 70s. You know, and I keep saying this, uh, but in the mid-70s, Manhattan went bankrupt, and the center of economic activity in the United States was Dallas. And then we had a 50-year swing back the other way. I mean, why can't we have a 50-year swing back, you know? And Dallas is the center of economic activity. Or maybe it's not Dallas. Maybe it's Kansas. I don't know. You know, these things usually don't repeat quite exactly, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to be Los Angeles or Manhattan. 
And so this activity is going to go back to somewhere else, and it's going to be a long period of time where the guys in New York who write the narrative and write the research reports, they cry, but the rest of the country is just doing great. And, you know, because the rest of the country is living in a nominal world. And do you think that, you know, because that, in some ways, the key question there is, you know, people talked about the Federal Reserve need to break something. And it seems that they still have quite a bit of a job to do because, if we haven't got a recession, then the base layer of potentially where we have inflation is going to be significantly higher. And one of the arguments, I mean, one of the things we've seen with this sort of margins and profitability is that there's a lot of pricing power with employers, with corporates, handing on prices to consumers. And also, you know, although some people have seen their wages pick up, particularly those in the kind of real world, we've not seen them pick up in many instances, in a significantly real way, they're sort of a bit flattish because employers have this power. Do you think that the Fed needs to actually break the back of some of these employers, some of these corporates, effectively give them a slap on the wrist before we're through the cycle? And therefore, do you think we've got you know, two, three, four more hikes yet, or do you think we're nearly done? I don't really know. I mean, for a year now, everyone's told me this is the last hike and that we're going to have a recession next month. And then the next uh, cycle comes and the Fed hikes again and they say the recession is the month after. And after 18 months of guys telling me the recession is the month after, I've stopped knowing. All I know is we talk to a lot of companies and they're seeing no slowdown. If anything, things are accelerating. And, you know, that doesn't fit the Wall Street narrative of stuff's accelerating. And it's not just, you know, uh, revenues accelerating, but volumes are accelerating. Guys have orders in hand. They can't fill the orders. I mean, when you think of the U.S. economy, there's like a two-speed economy, right? You have everything tied to financial. We talked about this. And those guys, it's miserable. Interest rates are up, and they're probably not going down. And then you have the rest of the economy. Look, housing, they try to kill housing. Look at the home builders. They, you know, they had a dip for six months. Guys, you know, had some indigestion when mortgage rates went to seven. And then they, they're just ordering homes because you've got to live somewhere. You know, look at aviation. Uh, Effectively, there's two companies that make airplanes in this world, and you have six billion people on this planet that uh, want to fly, and you know, there's not much uh, flight density. I mean, look at India. Look how few airplanes they have. Look at China. Look at Africa. These guys are ordering planes. Boeing and Airbus have the biggest backlogs ever. I mean, think how many jobs are created by all the subcomponent uh, suppliers to these aircraft. These are high-paying jobs. Look at uh, military. I mean, we keep uh, gifting stuff. I mean, we emptied the warehouse. We, 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 we built, you know, munitions that were supposed to last us through World War III. And it turned out that six months into a war in a country I can't find on the map, well, it's gone. Like, no one knows where it went. It's gone. I mean, we, we got to refill the whole warehouse again. Like, think of how many jobs are created by building missiles and drones and bombs. And, like, you know, uh, automotive, that's still strong. Like, you start going around, everything that touches industrial is just white hot. And yeah, it really sucks if you're a junior analyst at a VC fund right now because you're probably going to get fired. But everyone else is killing it. And you know, that guy who went to B school and has 300 grand of student debt, he's got to go learn how to weld because that's where the jobs are this cycle. And I, I just think people don't comprehend this. And do you think there's, there's a sort of a difference here between, you know, it sounds like the core, or let's talk, call it the middle America rather than the coastal America is doing really well. But the rest of the world is sort of struggling. We keep on seeing, you know, disappointing data from China compared to what people thought we'd get from the reopening. Um, Germany's in a technical recession. A lot of people say, well, we don't care. But, you know, it seems that there are other parts of the world which are genuinely not, not so much necessarily properly struggling, but, but are not on fire. But you're saying that this bit is. Do you think this is basically U.S., parts of U.S., U.S. industrial complex is doing well and it's doing well because maybe it's taking away from some of these other centers that used to be the performance over the last 20 years? Well, I think it's just going to be a wealth transfer. These things go in cycles. Um, you know, we, we transferred all of our industrial activity to China, and now some of it's coming back. Is Germany failing? I don't know. Their stock market goes up every day. Um, you know, how bad could it really be? Um, you know, you kind of look around the world. I mean, just, just look at what's happening around the world. I, I think things are really quite strong. Uh, that's why the stock market doesn't go down. That's why everyone's really confused. Everyone's used to this world that existed basically from, let's call it 1990 onwards, where the Fed raises interest rates and banks stop lending, and then you know some hedge fund blows up, and the Fed panics, and 
you know, it gives more liquidity, and then equity prices go up as a wealth effect, and, you know, a couple hundred guys in Manhattan make money, and it all sort of trickles down over time, and the cycle kind of repeats. And I don't think the cycle is going to be like that. That was all like a house of cards built on financing stuff. And this cycle is going to be, hopefully, be built on creating actual stuff of value. And, I mean, we just see this around the world. Stuff's really strong. And, I mean, how else do you explain copper in the mid threes, like, or high threes? How do you explain a lot of things happening? Like, economic activity is really good. And, and I, I'm just not very bearish. <laughs> I do think the Fed will eventually succeed in breaking something. Yeah. It'll be some large hedge fund that I've never heard of. It, they might break themselves, honestly. Uh, you know, they might blow up a, a large central bank somewhere with weird swaps. They might blow up, you know, so, some country somewhere you, where, you know, the fiscal situation deteriorates. I mean, I, I might be talking about our fiscal situation here in America. Um, I, I think a lot of things are going to get really weird. But economic activity just seems strong to me. That's, that's you know, my, my, my gut feel here. And one of the areas where you know, people are looking, sort of th again, this sort of enigma type thing, the conundrum with, is with, within the energy markets and particularly oil, because OPEC keep on wanting to cut, talking about cuts. And the price of oil, you know, it's sort of been, will it, won't it, around this $70 level when looking at WTI. Is the oil market sort of saying, well, you know, maybe demand's not there. Is it just not looking forward far enough? It's just thinking about the here and now and the headlines. What do you think is driving that? Because the energy market, particularly oil, has been sort of not quite sure which way to go. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things going on in the, the oil market. I mean, if you want to cue in on that one, and, you know, we have a lot of exposure there, and we're quite, we're quite, bull, quite bullish. I mean, in the past six weeks or so, I mean, speculators have sold 400 million barrels of oil. I mean, you're talking about like 10 million barrels a day of physical supply added through paper contracts. I mean, of course the market's going to be heavy. Like, that's a lot of oil. Uh, it's hard to digest that much oil. I mean, speculators have one of the lowest uh, net long positionings in the history of the product. And so, yes, that, there's a lot of oil hit the market. Uh, but we've had a lot of oil really hit in the market since last summer. You have the SPR globally that's 300 million barrels, you know, round numbers. China was offline, caught 200 days at 2.5 million barrels a day. You know, in, in terms of China and the rest of Asia, that's a, a half billion barrels. Russia dumped something like 200 million barrels before the, the, the price caps came in. I mean, yeah, it, was a, it was a warm winter. Like, who the hell knows? Weather is weather. But that's another 100 million barrels less heating demand. Uh, Iran dumped uh, their floating inventory because they just need dollars. I mean, you start going around the world and you start looking at this like, wow, there's a billion and change barrel swing, including the, excluding the speculators. That's another 400. I mean, you're a billion and a half, maybe even a little more. We start adding it all up. Like, that's a lot of oil. I mean, over 300 days, give or take, like, that's like 5 million barrels a day of, of you know, change in balance. Of, of course oil is going to be heavy. And it takes some time to work through all that. And we're working through all of that. And I think the, the, the more impressive stat is that oil took it like a champ. I mean, oil basically dropped from mid-80s to low 70s. Like, it just took it like a champ. And where'd all that oil go? I don't, know, I don't know. I mean, look, we, we keep drawing inventory. Like, where'd it go? It got used. Um, and I think we're going to work through this. It's going to take a couple more weeks, a couple more months, maybe a quarter or two. I think oil's going to really surprise people because the demand is really strong. And, you know, you, you have a couple of uh, things driving this. But, you know, to start with, the six billion people on this earth that want the same standard of living that I have. I know it's really, you know, prosaic to kind of say it, but... I'm sitting here in Puerto Rico. It's a, it's a hundred something degrees outside. We're having a heat wave. I'm blasting my air conditioner. I drove here in my truck. I got you know a microwave and a refrigerator, and I got all these toys. I got the lights on. I mean, the vast majority, six billion people, they don't have a refrigerator. They don't even have uh, air conditioning. Like, I mean, much less you know motor vehicle transport. Like, these people, as they advance, they're going to start using energy, and it's not all, all going to be petroleum products, but their demand is going to go up uh, dramatically. Because I believe in human progress, and you know, that's why oil demand goes up uh, 2 or 3% a year every single year. And I don't think that's going to stop. And you know, then you have some other things. You know, China was offline. Well, they're coming back online. Is it going to take longer than people thought? Yeah, of course. It's a very complicated economy. You can't just flip a switch. 
Uh, you know, it's going to work its way through. They've had some resurgence of COVID. Everyone's kind of brainwashed over there. So they all go hide in their apartments, play video games every time COVID flares up in their little town. Eventually, they'll all be immune, just like we are here. And then COVID goes away. Um, you know, work from home took 500,000, a million barrels just in the U.S. alone. You know, globally, it's probably a million, two million barrels of, of demand disappeared. Well, bosses are saying, get to work. Like, we're not very productive. No one's, you know, at work. You're like, you got to do three days a week. Like, every company's saying this now. Like, I think these things all reverse in six months. I think demand's going to just be stunning people. And then where does the supply come from? No one's investing right now. Like, oil's at 70. Who wants to drill a well? Like, uh... I just think these things yo-yo, and we're going to have a good upcycle now. And when, when you talk about that, and obviously it's not investment advice, but would you be looking at taking, thinking about the oil itself, or do you think things like the services sector, you know, the, the actual sort of industrial infrastructure, is the better way to play? Because a lot of these sort of mining or extraction companies often have a little bit of a high, well, have a higher beta to the underlying commodity. How would you think is the best way to play that? And let's say, just adding to that, if you were playing it in the underlying, would you be looking at doing it through futures or would you think about maybe longer dated calls? How would you approach that without giving investment advice? So, you know, we, we own some uh, futures. We own, uh, you know, a pretty large pile of uh, futures options for 2025, December, out of the money mostly. Uh, I think that's a levered way to play uh, what I see happening. But honestly, you want to play it through uh, operating businesses because those are the things that multi-bagger. And those are the things where every day that oil sits here at 70, I'm earning money. You know, I, I own uh, two services companies, uh, both offshore. Um, I'm, I'm buying the equipment, uh, the floating equipment for pennies on the dollar of replacement costs, which is always a good place to start. They have great balance sheets, huge and accelerating backlogs. And they're earning money. Every day that goes by, it's worth a little bit more because they've earned a bit of money. And I just like that trade better. Uh, anytime you can buy something at 10 cents on replacement cost, I'm going to do it a lot. And I have done it a lot. And, you know, uh, Valeris and Tidewater, two companies I own, they're very large positions for me. I just think that's a better way to play it. If you think about this conceptually, in, in the U.S., people kind of know where the oil is. Like, there haven't really been big discoveries in a while. But offshore, I mean, you've seen some massive discoveries in the last few years. And I think that's where incremental uh, spending will be. And the way you're going to fix this coming energy crisis, and it's going to be a crisis, um, is to incrementally spend a few hundred billion dollars a year every year for many years. And I kind of want to be in the way of that spending. I, I'd much rather own my services companies than a producer. I, I just think my services companies, especially because all the money's already been spent for this equipment. Um, you know, now the cash comes in at a high margin and it just goes to shareholders. They don't intend to spend anymore. That's way better than an oil company that Money comes in, it just goes down the hole. Like, I, I don't want that. So, no, I, I just like the idea that this money's going to get spent. And are these companies, I mean, we've not really had, I mean, we've actually had quite stable oil in reality. How, have they been performing okay through this sort of period of, you know, this little bit of a pullback? Because, you know, it's, if they have, then that augurs well for, if we do get even a small uptick, then these things could really um, start to shoot for it. Yeah, they're doing quite well. I mean, Tidewater is a few dollars off a multi-year high and maybe all-time high. Uh, you know, Valaris pulled back a bit, but it's been super strong. It's been far stronger than uh, the price of oil and far stronger than, you know, a basket of the producers if you look at like an ETF. So, no, I, I think th that relative strength is telling you that these businesses are getting better. And far more importantly, I think, is uh, leading edge day rates. Uh, and leading edge, edge day rates are making new highs, even though the price of oil has kind of been kind of moribund in this like 70 to 80 range. You know, an, an ultra deep water rig, uh, start of the year, 200, 250,000 a day contract. We just signed one at 495,000. I mean, it, it makes new highs almost every month. And so I, I think this is telling you that the demand is picking up, that large oil companies, they don't invest for tomorrow's oil price. They, they make an investment over a five, 10 year cycle. And they're saying there's an energy crisis coming and we want to spend this money. And we want to spend this money now before the price of uh, the equipment goes up even more. And when you think about the sort of medium to slightly longer term, I mean, you know, there is this obviously there is this massive underinvestment that we've had in pretty much the whole extraction world over the last 10 years. Going forward, you know, it's you know, people talk about it almost being um, a sort of slam dunk, but it's going to be a volatile kind of journey there because clearly we should expect significantly higher prices, which then will destroy demand in certain senses and then we'll see it come back. 
How do you think about this 10-year you know, view, maybe even longer, you know, let's say 2050 view, where we're trying to do this transition, whether it's realistic or not is another thing, but it probably will be, rather than a one-way ticket of straight up in prices on the underlying, it's going to have a lot of volatility on the way. What's, what's the way that you think about that? Well, it's going to be volatile. I mean, commodities are very, very volatile, which is part of why I like them so much. You know, uh, I'm not here trying to make 10 or 15 percent a year. I'm trying to dramatically outperform. And you need an asset class that's volatile if you want to outperform. And you have to play the cycles. And there'll be a part of this cycle where the price overshoots and then I'll get out. And, uh, you know, I'll wait until it undershoots and then probably get back in again. Uh, I think this is my third or fourth uh, petroleum uh, energy cycle in my career. I've been doing this 25 years. These things repeat, and I just want to play the cycles. And you know, I'm going to bounce around. You know, this cycle we're doing it through um, uh, offshore energy services. The next cycle there'll probably be some different sector that's uh, mispriced, and we'll play it through some other, you know, avenue. Like you, you got to be flexible and creative in this. But no, I just want to uh, play these cycles. And yeah, we're going to overshoot. The history of oil is the price goes up. They produce more of it. Uh, demand gets destroyed a little. It's, demand really doesn't get destroyed. That's the weird misnomer. It's just that supply comes. I mean, look back to 2008, because I think people took the really long, wrong lesson. In 2008-9, uh, demand declined by 2%, which is really one of the, the, the largest declines you know, outside of COVID in, in the history of uh, petroleum. So 2% sounds really crazy. And the price of oil collapsed. What people forget is that uh, supply grew 3%. So you have a 5% swing, which is really, really large. And that's why the price collapsed. It, it, it's the growth of supply more than the contraction of demand. I mean, if we had a 5% swing in uh, balances, I think we're still undersupplied this cycle, <laughs> which is why you know, I think all the recession bros that are out there shorting oil are kind of delusional. But um, no, I intend to just play these cycles. I, I'm a cycle guy. And so with that cycle, how long do you think it'll take for this sort of position of underinvestment and effective undersupply to rebalance itself? Is this a two-year view or is it a five-year view? Because obviously these are big infrastructure projects in many senses. What, what sort of time frame do you think we'll get back into a sort of a, a fairly sort of normal equilibrium in, in, the, uh, in sort of the oil market? Well, I think it's going to be faster than that, but it, it's going to be balanced because you're going to have to destroy uh, demand. Uh, the supply just can't come on fast enough, given the, the imbalances I see. No, you're going to have to destroy demand. You have to take the price up to triple digits, and destroy, you have to really destroy the demand side. Uh, that's the only way this will ever balance. The supply doesn't come on fast enough. So, no, I, I think you're going to have an energy crisis. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the way to say we're having an energy crisis. Fair enough. And, and you know, we, we talk about um, you know, the transition world. We've got to get dirty to, before we can get clean. I think you know, people think we can just go clean, and obviously we can't. But let's just turn, turn to that because, you know, yes, we've got to get dirty, but there is, you know, people are focusing on other sources, for instance, uranium being one of, the, one of the sort of big ones. What are you feeling on that one? Because, again, it's, I wouldn't say it's a consensus trade. It comes and goes, but it's been, you know, it bubbled away from 2018 for three or four years, and then it really took off sort of, again, in terms of people's excitement over the last 12, 24 months. Do you see this thing as being perhaps the best way to play it? Well, it's a different way to play it. Um, you know, if nuclear energy was invented yesterday, you and I would be saying this is the greatest technology. It's, it's liberating for humans. We're going to create this almost unlimited amount of electricity for almost no cost. You know, it's stable, baseload, reliable. It's the greatest energy possible. But the 70 years of baggage, and as a result, uh, it's not proliferating at the rate it should be. If anything, you know, they're closing nuclear power plants in some countries because they're total morons. And, um, you know, th th these things go in cycles also. Uh, you know, five years ago, they were talking about closing all the power plants. Now you have countries like France uh, saying, hey, wait a second, we've got to keep these things on. You know, let, let's build some more of them. Korea is doing the same. Japan's saying, let's go turn them back on. California just turned one on. Michigan's talking about turning one on. People are coming around because these things go in cycles. And they've tried every other option, and they realize that the other options don't really work. They're super high cost. They're intermittent. And they come with a lot of uh, environmental contamination that's really dangerous. Um, and I, I think the world's going to pivot towards nuclear over time. Uh, but, but in terms of, you know, in my view, like an overtime isn't an investment thesis. We're looking out somewhere between one and three years and saying, where's the world going to? Because that's my investment timeline. And 
I think you have a really bad uh, nuclear uh, uranium deficit. It's just the, the imbalance between supply and demand is, is off kilter. Uh, that, that, that happens in lots of commodities. I do a lot of commodities. You know, supply and demand is really, really easy, and the price stays below the cost of producing it for a long enough period of time, and a bunch of producers go bankrupt, they shut down the mine, and then you know, it balances eventually, and then you have a deficit, and the price goes up to get these mines to turn back on. And there's usually a lag, just like there's a lag on the way down, there's a lag on the way up, and they tend to overshoot in both directions, and eventually you, know, you have another surplus. It's, it's the cycle, whatever. And, um, you know, I think this cycle, we shut down a lot of uh, uranium mines. And on the way up, I think it's going to overshoot, but I think it's going to overshoot really, really dramatically because the deficit's really, really large. It takes a while to restart these uh, mines. And uh, the, the, the demand balances that people were looking at a year ago or two years ago, they're not accurate anymore. Like I said, you know, Korea is going to stay online. Uh, Japan's coming back online. You have the, 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 the demand side exploding. And the supply side is getting further restricted because suddenly, you know, we're about to pass a law banning Russian imports. Well, Russia is, you know, 40-something percent of enriched uranium. Like, where are we going to get the uranium from? Kazakhstan's having issues uh, exporting uranium. Well, there's 60 percent of the world's unrefined uranium. Like, well, where are we going to get U-308 from? You start looking at the whole uh, commodity supply chain, it's, it's a little screwed up right now. And I think you're going to have a situation where... The uranium doesn't get to the places it needs to. There's still a deficit. And uh, the, the, the smarter uh, power plants out there are going to say, hey, look, we've ran our inventory down from five years, which is you know, where it was a few years back. They're now at two years. Let, 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 let's refill. Let, let, let's have a, a buffer here. Um, and refilling that buffer is a couple hundred million pounds of incremental demand in a market that's running at a large deficit. I mean, the deficit's kind of like 30 million pounds this year. But if you look at what's happening with uh, enrichment and uh, the, the, the swing of underfeeding to overfeeding, I, th I think the deficit could be a much bigger number when you actually look at it all. And um, I don't know where the pounds come from. And that's why the price keeps going up. Look, I bought uranium uh, when, when the physical price was around 31. This was uh, the fall of 2021. It was a good investment at 31. Uh, here we are today. It hit... Uh, a new multi-year high. I mean, if you exclude the one week uh, where uh, Russia invaded, where it kind of spiked up and came back down. Uh, we're at a multi-year high right now at 56. And I think we're gonna keep making new highs almost every week because you have a supply and demand imbalance and reactors uh, are, are starting to buy. So I, I, I like this trade a lot. I, I like uh, everything in the, the, the uh, nuclear supply chain. But in particular, I just like owning uh, physical uranium, and there's a couple of vehicles that let you do it, and you know, choose your poison. They all have pluses and minuses, but I, I think that's a better way to play this trade, and I think it'll overshoot uh, uh, uranium to a few hundred dollars a pound. And do you think it'll be um, maybe boosted further by some of the kind of unrealistic expectations, you know, talking about transition between now and 2050? seems a lot of the thesis around, for instance, cobalt, lithium, copper is that, from, to get from where we are to where we want to be in 2050, we need X amount of these. My God, there's, you know, we need more than we've ever mined in our whole history. Well, actually, doesn't that probably mean that we've got no chance of mining this between now and 2050 in a meaningful way? So therefore, sometime someone's going to go, this is ridiculous. We need the alternative. Uranium and nuclear is the only sensible one. Do you think there's some unrealistic, unrealistic expectations on the other side of this transition story that are starting to play out? Well, the, the whole thing is kind of a farce. Uh, you know, I, I don't really think there is a climate crisis. I, I, I don't believe in any of that nonsense. I, I just think that's a giant grift. But, um, you know, grifters are going to grift. And if you send enough lobbyists to Washington, they will subsidize your crazy ideas. And you can steal billions or hundreds of billions or even trillions of dollars by reworking the economy to be green. But what we've learned is that these things aren't actually green, and there's huge flaws to all the various green technologies. Most of them don't even uh, net, uh, pro you know, produce less carbon. Uh, it's all just a big hoax. It, it takes something that's really simple, which is burning, um, you know, fossil fuels. It makes it really, really complex with a lot of steps in between. And then what we learn is that people get in the way of even, you know, solving those steps. Like, you know, I I've seen lists of various. Uh, uh, elements that we need to do this green transition. I can't even pronounce half these things. Rare earth, you know, germanium, and you, know, you just look at these things, and then you say, where does it come from? Well, it's gonna be, you know, 
25 times the world's production of it today, and we need it all next year. And then someone tries to build the mine, and the government says, no, you can't have the permits to build the mine. So then where does it come from? Like, the whole thing makes no sense. It's, it's all just a, a giant make-work thing, and I think that these are things that, uh, at 0% interest rates, where there's tons of liquidity in the system, everyone is willing to go speculate on crazy dreams, and I think at 5% interest rates and a uh, financial system under some strain, people get a little more circumspect and they say, why, do we, why are we doing this? You know, the, the current stuff mostly works. Like, why are we doing this funny stuff? And, you know, maybe it's not this country because we're a rich country and we could probably afford to be stupid for longer. But, you know, other countries are saying, what are we doing? Look at South Africa. Their electric system broke. I mean, they, just last week they said, why are we shutting down our coal plants? We're sufficient in coal. We produce a lot of coal. We, we don't produce solar panels here. Why are we building these things that cost a ton of money? We're short on you know, hard currency. We have to buy it from someone else, install it. It doesn't really work very well. Like, I think one by one, countries just start saying, no, this doesn't work. And they're going to all return to nuclear. You know, the French came back to nuclear. They tried everything else. Even the Germans, they'll try everything else. They'll eventually come back to nuclear because it works. And, you know, it's a weird odyssey that every nation has to go on. And things have been too good for too long. And eventually, I think they'll come back to nuclear because it's a viable option. And I think you're going to see a lot more nuclear power built. Uh, the technology's advanced quite far. It's gotten a lot more efficient, a lot safer. I just think it's going to be the future of uh, power generation or, you know, at least a large component of the future of power generation. And then you have to ask yourself, well, where does the uranium come from? Because they haven't built new mines in a while. Where does, uh, you know, conversion, like they haven't built capacity. Where does enrichment come from? Like that whole supply chain needs to be redone because suddenly, you know, if you look at the, the number of power plants that were supposed to be operating in 2030 and you look at the data from two years ago, and you look at the data now, I mean, the day 2030 hasn't changed, but the number of power plants has grown, you know, demonstrably. And as a result, like, there could be bottlenecks and issues, and I like investing in bottlenecks and issues because you need the price to go higher to incentivize people to solve the problem. It's really easy. So just picking up on something you said just at the end there and actually slightly earlier, and to use this to sort of change tax slightly, which was, you know, 5% interest rates or higher interest rates, problems in other countries perhaps, debt. You know, there's this world where we've still got loads and loads of debt, potentially we're going to higher levels of interest rates. You're talking about other basket cases. In the rest of the world, you see which areas do you see as being basket cases, ones where this combination of potentially these higher levels of interest rates, even if they do drop, they, let's say, reestablish themselves at a higher plateau, along with this debt. I mean, is it Japan? Is it Europe? Where do you see the, the sort of, you know, the domino falling, as it were? <laughs> All of these. <laughs> um... You know, we had a period of time where people got in their head that debt doesn't matter, that deficits don't matter, that you can take an economy and regulate the hell out of it and, you know, basically stymie people. I mean, your most productive asset in any country is your people. And if you have most of your people doing busy work and filling out forms and applying for documents with the government and then a bunch of other people on the other side of the table with the government telling people, no, resubmit the form, well, then you, you, you've destroyed value, capital, whatever you want to call it. Um, and the Western world's been doing that for like 50 years. But it got much worse because, you know, you do it a little bit and it doesn't matter. But you do it a lot and suddenly there's a problem. And I think, you know, we, we, we've hit the tipping point where these things matter. And that plus debt plus deficits equal inflation. And I think you're going to see a lot of inflation. The Fed's not going to be able to defeat the inflation because the Fed doesn't really understand what creates inflation. And I think you're going to see uh, a lot of problems. And I'd be really skeptical of a lot of these over-indebted uh, OECD countries. I, I, I don't get the sense that they even recognize what the problem is. And the first step to fixing a problem is recognizing the problem. And do you think, so it sounds like you're probably more in favor of emerging markets rather than developed markets uh, on that basis. But do you think it's unlike, let's say, 2000 to call it 2014, where we could buy all commodities, they all went up, we bought all emerging markets. Both in the commodity space and the emerging market space, there's going to be more dispersion. You've got to be more careful about the, the battles that you fight in that space. Or do you think this is just going to be a case of buy emerging markets and don't worry too much about developed? Or do you think, you know, how do you think that one's going to fall out? Is it going to be emerging markets are having their time in the sun again? Well, I think emerging markets should do quite well uh, just because the valuations are low. It's been a bear market and I, 
I hate to just dump a bunch of countries into a basket and treat them all as one. You know, that's a, that's a mistake most Wall Street guys do. Um, but, you know, as a grouping, they've had a bad run of it. Uh, and valuations have dropped a lot while uh, the GDP of these countries keeps growing. And I think this is going to be a catch up. And you look at, you know, the U.S. where the GDP hasn't grown that much or nowhere near as fast, but the valuations have grown dramatically. And I, I, I would think you're going to do better in uh, emerging markets, but you have to be really selective. You know, emerging markets, I mean, they're emerging for a reason. And the reason they're not developed markets is usually rule of law. And uh, you have to be really careful. You want to go into the countries where uh, property rights, rule of law, you know, kind of an Austrian uh, mentality in, in regards to economic activity is on the ascendancy, and the ones on the way to socialism you want to get out of. And so I think you have to be selective and choose uh, your battles. And does that mean things like, you know, I, I hear quite a lot of, you know, when we talk about not so much deglobalization, but re-globalization, but on regions, do you think that's going to be very beneficial to those, for instance, if the U.S. is stronger than a lot of the other developed markets, maybe the Mexicos, the Brazils of the world, et cetera? Do you think it's going to be a regionalization play rather than, you know, this sort of big play that we had before? Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot more regionalization. I mean, Mexico is going to be a winner. Um, I think a lot of LATAM is going to be a winner. Uh, they got disintermediated and... A lot of manufacturing went to Asia, and it's probably going to come back here. Uh, you know, I, I think lots of parts of the world are, will be winners. Lots of parts will be losers. I, I, I don't know enough to know to really choose my winners and losers, but I do think places that have uh, a, a certain uh, capacity to produce energy and that uh, have their own natural resources, and they don't have to pay someone else for them, I think those are going to really be the winners because you're going to have an energy crisis and you want to be long places that produce their own. And you, I don't want to say you want to be short something, but you, you want to be skeptical of places that are going to be importing uh, energy because energy is going to be an expensive, expensive resource over the next couple of years. And within, for instance, it, it kind of goes back to my view that, uh, t you know, t Texas produces energy. <laughs> you want to be long Texas. <laughs> Manhattan doesn't produce much energy. <laughs> I think it's going to zero. And so, so within that, I mean, you know, we've talked about Germany. And again, you know, you may not have a strong view on these things, but, you know, I, again, I'm amazed that Germany is at the all-time highs, considering that it's always been a play on emerging markets and, you know, it's a bit of a basket case and all the rest of it. And the UK is also, the FTSE 100 is also near its highs. Admittedly, the FTSE 100 is not a UK index. It's a global index. But do you think that these are countries which, you know, is Germany going to struggle because it's going to take a while before it goes, actually, you know what, we do need to go nuclear? Do you think they're going to tax, effectively tax themselves to buggery before then? Do you think the UK is, is kind of screwed because it's thrown up loads more red tape post-Brexit because it didn't deal with it properly? Are these, ones, are these sort of countries where you think, maybe not? Yeah, I don't, I don't think those are the, the, the winners you want to go for. I think they'll muddle along and probably do okay and... Look, valuations went nowhere for 20 years. They, they were cheap. Um, but I don't think that's where you want to be going for the winners. You want to be in the countries that are addressing issues and doing it smartly. I mean, look at Dubai. Look at how they're winning. They just keep winning over and over. They've avoided all these dumb conflicts everyone else has gotten themselves uh, you know, tangled up in. They're playing all sides. They're friends with everyone. Capital keeps flowing there. I mean, I've been to Dubai. It, it, it's it, it, it's just a pile of sand. And just to think what they've been able to accomplish by having smart uh, policies and attracting people that want to make the place better. Um, you know, and you see all these other countries that are driving off their best and brightest and driving capital out. I mean, that's the opposite. And I know Dubai is, you know, a, a, an odd example because it's a small little country. But the countries that are doing the right things are where you want to be. And in terms of those, those tech sectors, well, when I say tech sectors, in terms of the tech sector, because this is, again, another conundrum that we've got in the market, which this time we're seeing yields remaining relatively high and obviously a very, very small concentration of tech stocks doing incredibly well. Do you think that's a banana skin? Is that something that, again, we've got to be very cautious about? Or do you just think that, you know, flow begets flow and, you know, you just play that sort of people should just let that trend play itself out? Because it feels that in your world of potentially higher interest rates, um, you know, commodities obviously going higher. We will get a reconnection between yields, interest rates, and those tech stocks, which currently look like they're doing really well. To me, this feels like an echo rally. Um, I, I'm reminded of 2000 and 2001. You know, in, in March of 2000, everything peaked out. 
and then it all kind of detonated. And then in uh, the fall of 2000, uh, a couple of stocks barely made new highs. You know, your Cisco Systems of the world, they, 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 they went up. And even to t then, you know, it kind of fell off. And then in the 2000 was a bad year for everyone, if you were in tech. And, um, but, you know, there was an echo rally in some of the big names. And then in 2001, we had a pretty long rally off the lows. And a lot of things rallied. And people said, it's all done. It's all clear. Get back in the pool. And it lasted six or nine months. And then it just kind of rolled over that summer, and it just didn't come up for the air for over a year. And I, I think that's kind of the same. You, you've had these little short, sharp rallies that sucked people in last year. But I think this is the big one where the amount of time that's gone on and the amount of performance pressure people are feeling where, you know, if you didn't own NVIDIA this year and you didn't own Google and uh, Meta, I mean, your year is kind of crap. And I feel like that's just brought people in. It's forced people to play. People that probably don't want to play, they have to play. And that's how you create these echo rallies. And then it starts rolling over, and all the guys who were playing that didn't really want to play, down 10%, they say, Phew, I'm done. Get me out. And, and every week it's out at the same time. It, it rolls over. I think you're going to see this echo rally uh, kind of fall apart in the fall. And you know, this isn't a call on the GDP or the economy, though. You know, if you raise interest rates high enough, things decelerate, and we have seen some deceleration. But I, I tend to think these overpriced uh, tech stocks are going to roll over this fall, and it's going to be pretty ugly. And I, I don't want anything to do with that. We have no exposure there, not long or short. I think the worst thing you do is try to short these things because, you know, if something doesn't make sense, you know, it, it can always, you know, two times not make sense or three times not make sense, then you're out of business. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a lot of people get run over this year, and uh, they keep asking themselves why they got run over, and I don't have a good answer for them. Uh, you know, you just, you just don't short these things. Uh, I think you just buy cheap stocks with good tailwinds and let it happen. And there's a lot of sectors that are really doing well. I just focus there. I mean, that's, I mean, such an important point you're making there, or sort of indirectly making there, which is the risk management side of things. Because, you know, you've had a couple of blockbuster years, and, and you know, you've been talking about some of the positioning where some of your peers are down, you know, multiple double digits, and yet you guys are not. You've had, you know, not as good as the last couple of years, but it's been okay. So what is it that you've been doing to make sure that you're not, obviously not all eggs in one basket, key, but how do you sort of approach that? Because you say you love volatility and volatility, when you look at someone like Chris Benodi is up 50%, down 50%, but you've had fairly good few years and then you've managed to kind of go through whilst you've had these fairly strong views on, on energy and you know, some of your peers have done badly. So what, what are you doing or how do you deal with that sort of scenario? Well, we buy cheap stocks. Cheap stocks don't go down. They go sideways. I mean, they could go down, I guess, but they don't go down a lot. Uh, companies with large buybacks and a lot of cash flow, they go sideways for a bit. And then, you know, the trend reengages and you make money. Uh, the guys who get hurt usually get hurt shorting, honestly. Uh, or they get hurt, they take on too much leverage. Or they do something like they buy crude oil at the top as opposed to, you know, buying Valeris and Tidewater, which... You know, they didn't top out last year with crude oil. You know, you want to be in the things that are cheap. And cheap things just keep going. But they protect you on the downside, and that's really important. I mean, I get trades wrong all the time. And, you know, I get a lot of stuff wrong. Uh, but if you get it wrong and you get out with all your money or you lose, you know, 10 or 20%, so what? You know, the next one you get wrong, you make 10%. Like, it all kind of balances. And you let your winners run, and you end up having, you know, a good rolling three years. You know, individual months and quarters, I have no idea. Like, I, I don't play for that. I, I feel like a lot of people, especially recently, they play for next month's number. I mean, do you know how many people ask me, what do you think the market's going to do next month? What do you think is going to happen with NVIDIA? Like, who cares? I have no edge there. Like, I don't know what the market's going to do. Like... You know, I, I, I can look forward two or three years and have a pretty good view of things, and most things I don't really know. And I just focus on the stuff I understand. And I feel like way too many people, they, they all year long, they say, oh, we're having a recession. Okay, fine, we're having a recession. Well, so uh, I'm going to short a bunch of stuff. Okay, but that hasn't worked. You know, we haven't had a recession yet. Um, and they're so focused on the, hey, we're going to have a recession, I'm going to have a 10% pullback, that they, they, they've missed all the stuff that's worked this year. And even worse, they, they lost a ton of money shorting, all trying to avoid a 10% pullback. And it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I feel like people are really myopic. And if they were willing to say, you know, 
every couple of years, I'm going to have a really nasty drawdown. I'm going to be down 20, 30, 40%. That's just how investing works. And if they're honest with themselves and then they're honest with their clients, they can tell their clients, look, we're going to have a pullback. You should give me more money then. I'm not going to try to protect against the pullback because playing defense is difficult and it doesn't really work. And if, if they were willing to be honest, I think they'd make a lot more money. Their lives would be a lot more enjoyable. Um, you know, it's something I think we've been really forward with people. We intend to have a da down 35 every 18 to 36 months. Like, that's our goal. And uh, as a result, we don't care about playing defense, which means that we're, was, all my friends got chopped up. They had, every month they bought more puts. The puts went to put heaven. We haven't wasted capital there, which is, I think, why we've done better. And I suppose... Well, the even worse is that let's say we got the recession, but you know, it was a 1980 style, 1982 or 1991 style in the actual risk markets where you got a, a fairly negligible pullback um, in the equity market. So, I mean, it's great to predict a recession, but it's irrelevant if the asset prices don't act like there's a proper recession going on anyway. So I guess that's, that's the issue is that we get too focused on predicting recessions and we forget that actually it's what the underlying assets are doing that ultimately pays our bread and butter. Um, and therefore, you know, just as you sort of look at that, is that, I mean, it sounds like you're in, I wouldn't say recession-proof stocks because it might be that the stocks that you're in go up because the thing that causes a recession is maybe oil and the Fed having to, or oil going high or commodities going high and the Fed having to react and so you're coming off a much higher base. But do you think there is this sort of, you know, it's basically a world where, there are some recession-proof-ish type of stocks that you could have and just sit through them? And do you think these are the right ones, these, these things like the infrastructure stocks and the commodity space? Well, I mean, I think people forget that in the 1970s, we had a recession and oil went crazy. You know, you can have a recession where commodities do well. Um, you know, every cycle is a little different with their own little wrinkles. And just because the last few recessions uh, were bad for commodities doesn't mean the next one won't, won't be surprisingly good. You know, th there's no hard set rules here. And I think people are going to be surprised. I think this recession is going to be different because everything about this economic cycle has been different. Um, you know, if you want something that's uh, recession proof and nothing's recession proof, uh, I would look at something like uranium. Look, uh, if you have a 30, 35 million deficit uh, every year, and the world needs 185 million pounds of this stuff, at some point you're going to run out of uh, stuff in the warehouse, and the price is going to go up as people start panicking because a nuclear power plant's a multi-billion dollar paperweight if you don't have uranium to refill it. And as a result, uh, people are going to panic, and they're going to pay almost any price to get uranium to fill the nuclear power plant. I mean, just, just think about this. You have a guy who runs a public utility. He, you know, doesn't work very hard. They pay him millions of dollars a year. His job is to golf with congressmen. Like, it's a really great job. Like, you don't want to lose that job. You know, it's just an amazing job to have. And the way you get fired is you go to your regulatory commission, you know, that sets your rates once a year, and they say, we forgot to buy uranium, and then the price went up, and we said the price is too high, and we didn't buy any uranium, and then when we panicked, there was no more uranium. Like, that's how you get fired. Like, why would you want to blow that job? You just have the uranium. Like, you're not allowed to run out. That, that's how the industry works. And so it doesn't matter what, if there's a recession or not a recession. You know, this isn't like uh, a coal plant where you shut it down you know, when, when demand declines a little. And U.S. electricity demand never declines um, or declines negligibly. Um, once you turn one of these things on, it goes for 40 to 60 years. And you have to refill it every two years. Like, that's just the way the rules work. Uh, they're going to shut some other thing down. So you don't have to care about GDP. You don't have to care about most anything. All you have to care about is the supply and demand imbalance. It's, it's, it's easier. I, I like trades like this. You know, I don't wake up in the morning and have to care what JPOW is doing. I don't have to care, you know, what, what currencies are doing or interest rates are. No, all I have to care about is are they building more mines and what does supply and demand look like next year and three years and five years? That, that's all I have to care about. It's, it's easy. Uh, I just like trades like this. Um, you know, I wish I had more trades like this because it's going to do its own thing and it's not going to care at all what happens to the stock market. You could have the stock market crash down 75% and, you know, electric utility still needs its uranium. Like, it just has different rules. Yeah. I was, and I was gonna electric say utility doesn't say, we're not going to refill because the stock market's down. We're not going to refill because, you know, NVIDIA doubled again. Like, electric utility refills. That's all it does. It's just a better trade, I think. And I wish I had more trades like this. And, 
I made it a very large trade because it's so unique. And, you know, that, I was actually going to ask you before you said, oh, I wish I had more trades like that. I was going to say, do you have any more trades like that? I guess, you know, people think that there are certain I, other I, parts. I do, but I... Are they Sorry, in the commodity saying? complex? Because that seems to be where there are these imbalances in the commodity complex with, you know, a lot of people talk about massive sort of cliff 20, 2024, 2025, where this imbalance of supply and demand really, really hits home. Do you see that it's kind of, you know, there are positions that you would accumulate now, even though you know that the real inflection point may be 18 months down the road? Because some people might go in 12 months time, oh my God, in 18, well, six months time down the road from then, it's going to happen. Well, my job is to buy cheap assets with massive tailwinds. And if the tailwind doesn't hit till 2025, well, that's 18 months away. The market prices these things forward. You know, we, we run a decently sized fund. We need to get exposure now. Sometimes it takes a few months to buy one of these things. And by then, you know, it's the fall. We're talking about 15 months away. 15 months happens fast. I, I want to have the position on. I don't really care. Like, I, I feel like a lot of people look at something and they say, oh, it's not going to happen until 2025. Let's, let, let, let's do the research the summer of 24. We'll buy it in the fall of 24. When you're too late. I think a lot of money's been missed, you know, uh, potential profits have been missed by guys saying that's next year's story. Because then they're not ready for when it starts moving. And it starts moving and they say, oh, I got to do something. And they end up paying up 20 or 30 percent. And, you know, in, in my industry, 20 or 30 percent is a good year. And if you gave that much money away to someone else, well, then you should be fired. You, you, you're lazy. I mean, it, 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 you're not allowed to just get a pass on something like this. And so, no, we'd be looking at stuff right now that we think is going to work in 25 and even in 26 and we're building up our inventory our industry knowledge and you know building up an inventory of stocks we want to play and we're waiting until maybe it gets a little bit more pregnant but you know we're definitely not you know just waiting till next year to put it on we, we want to have uh, exposure and you know we have this giant list of stuff we really are excited about i think and we're, we're just kind of waiting and then for us sort of uh, you know people watching this here you know retail investors etc in things like, you know, junior miners, whether it be in critical metals or metals or gold or whatever, you know, they, you know it looks like you look at specific stocks. You're, you're doing the work on the stocks. For people who can't do that, you sort of alluded to earlier that you shouldn't really look at the ETS because there's going to be too many doozers in there compared to the one or two winners. But do you think that these supply demand imbalances are sufficient enough for retail investors to be able to look at these ETFs? You know, not because you want to get big, big returns, but let's say each one's half decent returns. Do you think there's still value in those sorts of products or are there just too many losers amongst that list of stocks within them? I mean, ETFs, all right. It's, it's, I mean, it, it really depends. It's situational. Um, you know, when it comes to something like uh, uranium, I would just buy one of the entities that owns physical uranium. There's uh, Yellow Cake in the UK. Uh, ticker is YCA. We own some. There's a Sprott Physical Uranium Trust in Canada. Ticker is U hyphen U. We own a bunch. Um, you know, I, I just think it's a better way to play it. You don't take a lot of risk. I, I'm not a big fan of junior mining. I understand that when it works, it really works, you know. But I've seen a lot of these that don't work, and my batting average is just miserable. And, you know, maybe there's guys that are better at this thing than me. But after 25 years, I've learned that I'm really good at some things. I'm kind of mediocre at some things. And the things I'm not very good at, I should just stop trying to get better because... It's hopeless. I, I just don't make any money at junior mining. And so I, I don't do that anymore. OK, so but, we're sort of coming to the end now. I just wanna, I'm going to put you on the spot very briefly here and just say, OK, you, you don't see the recession that most people are seeing. Is it that the sequencing is going to be, because sequencing is kind of key, is it that we've got to see higher energy prices that forces the Fed to then break something to bring those energy prices back? That triggers a recession, whether it's big or not, doesn't really matter. But do you think that's the sequencing we get? We don't get a recession until we get triple digit, let's say, oil prices, a response from the Fed, which might be two, three, four more hikes that forces things to slow down because at the moment things are just going too well. I don't know if it's a Fed driven cycle. I mean, I think this cycle is weird because you have so much more fiscal. I mean, never before have we ran a 7% deficit during the boom. And if you look at uh, you know, 2022 tax receipts, uh, capital gains was a big piece of that. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if when they add it all up, we're running 9 10% deficits during a boom. Plus, you have COVID money that's been allocated and not spent. I mean, government is incompetent. You know, these guys got money in 21. They still haven't spent it. 
I mean, it, it's just sitting in bank accounts. It, it's going to get spent. Um, you look at what the Fed's done. I mean, 500 bips uh, on money market. You know, my parents have tons of cash. I have no idea why. You know, I, they should own stocks, but they, 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 they've owned cash. Well, now they're getting paid to own the cash for the first time in literally a decade. Like, it's a giant wealth transfer. Like, I feel like there's just money sloshing around the system, and the Fed can raise interest rates, but think of the Fed. You know, like, the average person, okay, ignore Wall Street, because Wall Street is its own little world. The average person, they bought a house in the last couple of years, they finance it under three, they have a 30-year mortgage, they have like 28 years left on it, they bought a car, they have, you know, it's a 60 to 80 month, well, they're slowly paying it off, you don't need a new car. What do they have that touches interest rates? They have their credit cards, great, you know, a couple thousand dollars, went up 500 bips, like, it's a couple hundred bucks a month, like, who cares? You know, the average person isn't tied to interest rates. That's, you know, a one percenter problem. That, that's a Wall Street problem. And, you know, the average person is much more tied to government largesse. I mean, think about my life. You know, if you gave me a million dollars tomorrow and you put it in my bank account, what would I do with it? I have everything I need right now. There's nothing I want to buy. Everything I want, I just go out and buy it. Uh, I've been successful in life. What would I do with it? I'll put it in my brokerage account. I'm going to buy more stocks. You know, that's all I know how to do. You know, and that's why when the government handed out money, every time they've done QE, every time they've done every, everything, that's what's happened. The stock market goes up because people like me buy more stocks. If you gave $100 to a middle class guy, he's going to take his wife out for dinner and it's going to go right into the economy. That night, he's going to take his wife out to dinner. And then the waiter is going to take their tip money and they're going to go out to the bar that night. Like it's going to go in this economy and cycle a few times. And that's why services is so strong. That's why you can't find any uh, labor anywhere. These guys... They have money. They're winning. Like, and I think people miss what uh, happens when you do fiscal. And fiscal just is so much more powerful than monetary. And we've lived in a monetary world, and now we're in a fiscal world. And I just think people miss that. And so go, go back to your question. I didn't mean to dodge it. I think you have a giant muddle. I don't think the Fed raises rates a couple hundred bips more. I think you lose a bunch of banks. And you know what happens? Absolutely nothing. You just lose some banks. That, that's all that happens. You know, some hedge fund blows up, some guy sells his uh, place in the Hamptons, and it's really, really sad for him. But the average guy doesn't care. And I just think it's the, a different sort of cycle. I mean, most people would say that, yeah, the, the, the U.S. market still needs a hell of a lot more concentration of its financial sector because it's just got so many of these uh, small beasts out there. Um, but Harris... Yeah, J.P. Morgan's going to own everything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, five years. exactly. I mean, Harris, it's great, great to listen to you. And it's really good to hear a constructive story that's not based on five tech stocks as well. It's just to hear a real economy story. So um, good to hear that. Uh, good to hear something optimistic. It's, it's not often that that comes about. So thanks very much for your time. Great to hear. And, uh, and I hope, you know, the year continues to be OK and, and, and good. I got a good feeling. The second half's going to be good. I got a good feeling about it. But thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm.